We have an interesting scriptural reading there from Galatians, which I'd just like to refer to as an introduction to my sermon. Because you have two ways of viewing things. You have the fleshly, carnal way of viewing things and doing things, which just has negative results. And you have the godly way of viewing and thinking and doing things, which is reflected in the fruits of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith. And I missed one or two, but... And that's always the case in life, that you have a choice of how you view things. My family, because my children like to take us as grandparents with them on a trip every year somewhere, this year again for the month of July, took a trip. And we did about 4,000 miles from here up through Arkansas to Tennessee, across the Smoky Mountains, across to Virginia, up to Pennsylvania to have a look at the Gettysburg National Memorial there, where the Battle of Gettysburg took place and Abraham Lincoln gave his famous very short speech. It's interesting, in case you don't know, somebody else spoke before he did. That man spoke for two hours. Nobody can remember who the man was or what he said. Abraham Lincoln got up and he spoke for about two minutes, if it was that long, one little page, known as the Gettysburg Address, in fact, the photographer, back in those days, it took a while to set up the cameras, you know, with the hood and the slide, uh, you know, to take the photograph. This man was still trying to get his camera fixed to take the photograph of the president giving his Gettysburg address. And by the time he got his camera correct, the president was gone. He'd already given the speech. <laughs> so all of you will think that that's a good idea for sermons. <laughs> Two minutes and we all go home. Well, that's a good idea. Anyway, from there we went down through Maryland to Washington, Washington D.C. Spent a week in Washington, D.C., we were there for the fireworks for July 4th, down by the Washington Monument. My daughter said we should get there early, so we got there early at 3.30 or something, and then it decided to rain, poured with rain. So here I was, July 4th, sitting on a folding chair with a poncho and a hoodie, in pouring rain at the Washington Monument, fast asleep. God gives to his beloved sleep. And then at about 4.30, it stopped raining. And then the crowds came. They knew better than we did. They came later. So we had this fantastic uh, 4th of July fireworks display got back to the camping site, the RV site where we were camped outside D.C. at about uh, 12.30, I guess. And then from uh, Washington, we went down to uh, cross to Chesapeake, across uh, Maryland to Delaware, from Delaware south back into to uh, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia. Then we went up to uh, Jamestown, 
and then from Jamestown we went back down to North Carolina where my son lives and from there we went out to the Outer Banks to to uh, swim in the ocean and a few other exciting things which I'll talk about either today or some other day. So we're traveling uh, through the country and as I'm traveling, of course, I'm always learning things. I learn before I go there. I study everything about the places we're going to go to. And I plan the trips. So I wanted to take the children to some of the battle sites that are important. And the first place we went to was Appomattox. Who knows what Appomattox is? Appomattox Courthouse. We have some children here. How many children know what the Appomattox Courthouse is all about? It's the place where General Lee and General Grant shook hands and basically ended the Civil War. Most inspiring to go there. If ever you have an opportunity to go there, please do. Most inspiring. Those were great men. Everything about it. It gave me a sermon for the Feast of Unleavened Bread because it said, Malice toward none. So I'm looking at this. Malice toward none, I think, yes. And the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 and 8 about the Passover. Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the unleavened bread of malice and wickedness, bad feeling against other people. Here were two people who had been fighting each other, this horrible civil war now drew to an end, and they stood there and they shook hands. And as General Lee walked out, all the northern troops who were there stood at attention and the officers saluted this man, the enemy they'd been fighting against. I could not help but look at these things and have the scriptures in mind. Which brings me to my sermon. How do we view things? Do we always view things in the light of the scripture? Today I could give you a lecture on geography of the United States or I can give you a lecture on the history of the United States or I can give you a Bible lesson. But basically I want to put it all together so that you learn to look at things not the way the newspapers portray it or the TV portrays it or your friends portray it or whatever but always in the light of the scriptures. Think of yourself like a bird. You're flying over the United States and you're seeing things and you have to come to some kind of a conclusion about this country, this glorious country. If you don't think this is a glorious country, then you should fly overseas somewhere and go find another one. You know, once you go over the Appalachian Mountains toward the east, you realize why it was that for over a hundred years the original colonists stayed on that side of the Appalachian Mountains. Right? The United States, if you look at a map of the United States, you've got the Rocky Mountains on the one side. It's back to front for you. On the west, you've got the Rocky Mountains up about 14,000 feet. And then you've got the Appalachians over in the east, between six and 7,000 feet. And the original colonists landed over in the east, settled there, and they basically never crossed the Appalachians except for a few individuals for over a hundred years. Why? Well, I'll tell you the answer. Because they were living in paradise. You go over there and you travel around. Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Delaware, North Carolina. 
You see farmland like you would not see in many, many countries. You see rivers, well-watered areas. You see a blessed country, unbelievably so. And when I saw that, as I've seen it many times before, I just keep marveling that what we don't always see is God's hand in it. It is so easy to talk down America. Of course, America's got problems. But every other country's got more. Blessings were poured out on this country like you cannot believe it. And you should be able, and I'm encouraging you to start looking if you never have, or if you did, once again, to renew, looking at these things through the light of the scriptures. I say that we went to Jamestown. Why go to Jamestown? Jamestown, if you came from England by ship, you would come up to the continental United States and you would find Chesapeake, which is a giant big inlet, a huge inlet, all the way from Norfolk, Virginia, goes past Washington, D.C., all the way to Baltimore. It was up at Baltimore where the English in the 18, War of 1812 bombarded Fort Henry, and the flag kept flying. And the next morning, Keyes was the man, saw the flag still flying, and he put a pen to paper and he wrote a poem, which became our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see the star-spangled banner still flying over there? That's where it came from, from Baltimore, top end of the Chesapeake. I wanted my grandchildren to see the Chesapeake, what it means, that great inlet, which at one time was so polluted you couldn't catch a fish in it. They've cleaned it up quite considerably. It's a blessing. Not everything's bad. A lot of people are working to improve things, and it's wonderful to see. But we got to this little place called Jamestown. That's where the ship sailed up the Chesapeake, turned left on this river, which they then called the James River. They found a little island, and that's where they settled. That was the first English colony in the United States in 1607. That place is so important that the Queen of England, Queen Elizabeth, has visited it twice and once in this millennium. And if you think she's way up in her 80s, why would she want to go there? Why would she want to go to a little spot that's the size of a football field in the middle of nowhere next to a river where all you have is some old dilapidated buildings that, you know, used to be buildings back in the 1600s. Why would she want to go there? Because she'd know the importance of it. I was amazed that she would go there. But you see, that's where the English people landed. Now it's hard to tell Americans that they're English. Now, not all of them are. But we should never forget that all the original settlers were English. So when you travel to Norfolk, Norfolk, that's a county in England. Suffolk, that's a county in England. You get all these names and you think you're in England. You think, look at all these names here. The James River. The Jamestown Settlement. Look at it through Scripture. In fact, let's make it even easier. If you have a Bible and you have an old King James Bible, it says here, the authorized King James Version. Why is that important? Because that's the James after whom that river was named. That was the James of Jamestown. This James. The Bible we carry, we don't realize. 
Now, we have all kinds of evangelical Christian ministers and preachers who, who nowadays try to say, tell us all of the founding fathers of the United States were good Protestant Christians. That's why we're a great country. That's not true. Our founding fathers were great spiritual people. <coughs> if you want to try to tell me which church Jefferson or uh, Benjamin Franklin or whoever else belonged to, you'd have a difficult time because I try to find out what churches they belong to, and it's very difficult. Basically, some of them called themselves deists. A deist is somebody who believes in God from deist, right, deity, but is not attached to some religious crowd because they came away from Europe to get away from all these big religious churches. So they were highly spiritual people. They believed in God. They read the scriptures. They knew the Bible. But they weren't necessarily the kind of Christians that we have today. They were real spiritual people. And we need to be real spiritual people instead of just saying, oh, I belong to whatever church. What's the use of belonging to some church and not being spiritual? So when you stand there at Jamestown, and you look at the ground there and you realize this is where the original pioneers landed. That's where it started. That's where this country started, in Jamestown. They named the state Virginia. Why do they call it Virginia? I'm going to give you a little history lesson. Virginia was named Virginia after the Virgin Queen. Who was the Virgin Queen? Elizabeth I. Right now the Queen of England is Elizabeth II. Many years ago, in the 1600s, there was Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen. So we have Virginia, and I bet you can walk around Virginia and ask people in Virginia, why is this called Virginia? I don't know. More often than not, I ask people in the United States about things in the United States, and the answer I get is, I don't know. I don't know. Now, we ought to know. Virginia was named after Queen Elizabeth, the Virgin Queen. What about the Carolinas? Where did they get their name from? From Carolus the Latin form of Charles, King Charles. If you don't think that the United States came here from Britain, that the British came over here, the English people came over here, and they came over here and settled here, all you have to do is go back to the East and just travel around, look at the names, and look and say, oh, wait a bit, they've got all these names from England. They just carried them with them across to the United States. Why did that happen? Why did this people, the people of the United States, why did they become the greatest distributor of the Bible? This is an Old Testament and Greek book that we got from Jews and from Greeks. Why would these English people be the ones that took this book and translated it into a multitude of languages and then sent it around the world? Why are we the people of the Bible? Because we're the people of God. And God destined it. You know, it started with the birth of a baby called Joseph. 
You can read the Old Testament, then you find that there was a man called Abraham, who had a son called Isaac, who had a son called Jacob. And Jacob had two wives. His uncle cheated him, gave him the wrong wife. And then said, but if you work another seven years, you can have the other one too. So he married Leah, and then he married Rachel. So he had two wives. Why are all these silly stories in the Bible? Because they tell us where we all came from. Then Leah had children, and Rachel didn't. So Rachel went to Jacob and he said, she said, have children by my servant. At least I can treat them as my children. So he, Jacob, he was a liberal. He didn't mind having children by four women, so he had now children by the third, um, by the other woman. So now he's had three. And then Leah saw that she wasn't having any children anymore, so she brought her servant girl and said to Jacob, Well, you have children by this servant girl of mine, so I can have more children. So, of course, Jacob says, Why not? So he goes and he has children by this woman. And if ever you read the Old Testament, you find there was a mess with these children of Israel, as they were called, you can understand why. They came out of a family where they were children from four different women. Anyway, finally, Rachel had a child. And she called his name Joseph. Because, as she said, God will add to me, hoping that she would have another child which she did. She had another boy, she called him Benoni, son of my sorrow, which was an interesting name to give to a boy because the mother knew that she was going to die having just given birth to that boy. But Jacob took the boy and he said, no, we won't call him Benoni. We'll call him Benjamin, son of my right hand. So you end up with 12 boys coming from this family and one daughter. 12 boys that gave rise to the 12 children of Israel. That's where all the tribes of Israel come from. This whole book, the Old Testament, is the story of those tribes. What happened to them through the ages? Why is it important? It's important to us because we can find out whether God lies. Now you will tell me God cannot lie. That's right. Because there was a time way back there where God said to Abraham, I will bless you, your children will be like the stars in the sky. That's how many they will be. They will be like the sand at the seashore. And if people think that only the Jews today are the descendants of Abraham, obviously it cannot be right, because you can count the Jews. You can figure out how many there are. Where are all the other tribes? That same blessing was passed by God from Abraham unto Isaac. God told Isaac, you are going to receive these blessings. And then Jacob, the grandson, God appeared to Jacob and he said to Jacob, you are going to receive these blessings. And Jacob had these children. And the one we re refer to, Joseph, he was sent into slavery. And then all the family followed them into slavery. And that's what we find in back here in Genesis 48, if you'd like to turn there. Genesis 48, 
where you find that Jacob now an old man and he's come down into Egypt and he has found his son Joseph who he thought was dead for many years he thought Joseph was dead he had found Joseph and Joseph came to see Jacob in Genesis 48 And Joseph, by this time, had two sons. Their names were, verse 5, Ephraim and Manasseh. Genesis 48, verse 5. <coughs> and now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. Here is Jacob now talking. Joseph had brought these two boys in front of him. Ephraim and Manasseh. <coughs> which were born unto you in the land of Egypt before I came unto you in Egypt. Jacob is speaking. He said, they are mine as Reuben and Simeon are mine. Now Reuben and Simeon were his firstborn and secondborn sons. He said, these two grandchildren are to me like firstborn and secondborn. You imagine Joseph watching this. His father, Jacob, is going to treat his two sons like firstborn and secondborn. They are mine as Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. And you can read more through it. And as was customary back in those days, as still is the custom in the church to bless children, to lay hands on them, to ask God to give them a special blessing. Israel, or Jacob, his name was changed to Israel. Verse 14, stretched out his hand, his right hand, and he laid up upon Ephraim's head, who was the younger, and his left hand upon Manasseh's head, guiding his hands wittingly, for Manasseh was the firstborn. When Joseph saw this, if you read the whole account, Joseph said, no, no, father. He thought his father was old and maybe he didn't see too well. He said, this is the firstborn son. Manasseh is the firstborn. Ephraim is the secondborn. But here, Jacob puts his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son. But he deliberately did that. Verse 15, And he blessed Joseph and said, God, before whom my fathers Abram and Isaac did walk, the God which fed me all my life long unto this day, and the angel which redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads, and let my name be named on them. Let them carry my name. And the names of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. And when J Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand upon the head of Ephraim, he had displeased him, and he held up his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head unto Manasseh's head. And Joseph said unto the father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Your right hand, put your right hand upon his head. And his father refused, and he said, I know, my son, I know it. I know what I'm doing, is what Jacob is saying. He also shall become a people. He shall become great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his seed shall become a multitude of nations. Ephraim, the younger one, would become a multitude of nations, where Manasseh would be a great nation. This was a promise by God. This re promise is repeated time and again in the scriptures. The question is, has God's promise been fulfilled or did God lie? No, God didn't lie. Where then would we find one great nation and then a whole group of nations? 
that are brothers, that are brothers. If this has anything to do in the days we're living in, it's not the Chinese. The Chinese is one nation. It's not the Indians. They're one nation. One nation. The only people it can be referred to is the English-speaking people. That weird bunch of people who for many centuries seem to just be fighting among themselves and then finally emerged as if from nowhere. You know, if you go back to 1400, 1492, what happened in 1492? Columbus discovered America, 1492. Spain and Portugal were the great nations. The English people and the Dutch people and some of the European nations, they didn't feature. And then suddenly in 1600, everything changed. English colonists came to the New World. Just a few. And now the colonists went up to Massachusetts. And some of them moved down to Rhode Island. And you ended up with 13 colonies. And we have on our flag 13 stripes. Why do we have 13 stripes? Children, why do we have 13 stripes on the flag? Because there were originally 13 colonies, right? There were only 12 tribes of Israel. How did we get 13? Because from this point forward in biblical history, Ephraim and Manasseh counted as two separate tribes. And when they went into the promised land under Joseph, Manasseh was given his portion and Ephraim was given his portion and they inherited as two separate tribes. So you ended up with 13. I am sure there must have been some of God's people here in the United States back in the 1600s who looked at the fact that there were 13 colonies and they would have thought, wait a bit, God is doing something here. Thirteen little colonies grew from thirteen little colonies to one giant nation, a miracle nation, because everything was against it. The English didn't want it to happen. They wanted to just keep them as colonies of England. But they had left England and they'd become and they wanted to become a separate nation. And barely had they become a separate nation when the nation was torn in half. Split right in the middle on the question of slavery. And you can look at the historical background of all of that. The people that came to the north were a lot of people who were thinking people in the sense of thinking of the good of people and the good of humanity and all the philosophers there. You know, that kind of people. People that came down the south in the early days. People who came here to make money. And the way to make money in those days was to plant cotton and tobacco. And in order to plant cotton and tobacco and reap it, you needed servants or slaves, which led to the importation of 
however many African Americans into this country, and that was the wealth of the South. That's why they didn't want to give up, because imagine if I came to you and I said, okay, give up all your wealth, your house, your car, your refrigerator, everything you have. You'd take exception to that. Well, that's what the government was trying to tell the people in the South. Give up your wealth. All those slaves you own. That was their wealth. Big money paid. They didn't want to give that up. And so you had a country that was virtually going to be split in half and become two countries. And some people said, why not? Look at South America. They became a whole bunch of countries. If South America can split up between Brazil and Argentina and Chile and Bolivia and Venezuela and whoever else, why can't we split up into two countries? We've got plenty of space. And one man said, not on my watch. That man was Abraham Lincoln, a man who knew the scriptures. There's no question that he had the conviction that God had blessed these people. He didn't understand everything, but he knew God had blessed this country in a way that no other country had ever been blessed. And as he said, I am not going to supervise the disillusion of the Union. And the country went to war. And if I ask you where was the first battle of the Civil War, you'll tell me the firing on Fort Sumter. Yes, there was a northern fort off the south, and southern army opened fire on that fort, and they hurt one man. That was the end of that fight. And everybody thought this war would be finished quickly, until armies of the north moved down into Virginia and faced armies of the South in the first real battle of the Civil War. Now listen carefully. The first real battle of the Civil War or the War of Northern Aggression, as some Southerners like to refer to it, showed that this battle wasn't going to be fought quickly it was going to be devastating. Thousands of people were going to die. It ended up that over 600,000 people died in that war. And that very first battle took place in Virginia, somewhat southwest of Washington, D.C., at a place called Manassas. Can you believe that? Can you believe that history would march on for thousands of years and you end up with two brothers fighting each other and the place they chose to fight each other would be at a place called Manassas? when you can prove publicly that these people were descended of the tribe of Manasseh. And in case we didn't get it the first time, the first battle of Manasseh, also called the Battle of Bull Run, was followed by the seven-day battle, where they fought here, there, and everywhere. And then they came back and they fought the next battle of Manasseh. In case you missed the first one, Here's another one, another battle of Manassas. And it was because of the victory of the South at the two battles of Manassas that General Lee then decided to attack North when he moved his armies across to Antietam and tried to invade Maryland where he was stopped. And then a year later he tried to invade Pennsylvania and he was stopped at Gettysburg. That's the story of the Civil War, very important part of our history, but all based on the fact that some wanted to destroy this union, and if they had done that, they would have destroyed God's word because he said, it'll be one great nation. 
when you see this nation, one great nation, you should realize that was God's word. God was speaking. Long before Nelson Mandela became a statesman in South Africa, there was another statesman in South Africa, which maybe some of you would have heard about. He was Field Marshal Christian Smuts. Very important man in history. He was a signator to the United Nations and the League of Nations. I remember that Herbert Armstrong telling me how he had actually met him, talked to him, at the San Francisco Conference back in 1946. Yanni Smuts, as we used to call him, was highly educated, was educated in Oxford University in England. He was giving a speech in 1917 at what was then called the Imperial Prime Minister's Conference. All the Prime Ministers of the British Empire gathered together in England. That included half the world. Anything from England all the way to India, all across Africa, everything on those maps back in those days that was colored in red. That was the British Empire. And Christian Smuts stood up in this conference and he was talking about conditions in the world which concerned him. And he said, when you look at the world today, you see the British Empire, which he said is more than an empire because within that empire, there are empires. India, Burma, other imperial nations. So he said it was, it's really a misnomer, a wrong thing to call it the British Empire. He said, as I look at the world, I see two nations. I see the United States, one great nation. And I see the British Empire, which I prefer to call the British Commonwealth of Nations. That's where the name came from. He gave it. He was a statesman at that time looking at the world and he said, this is what I see. One great nation and a group of nations. The British Commonwealth of Nations. Ephraim, the younger born, rose to prominence first. Britain was supreme for a long time until World War II. Then the younger brother took over. Manasseh. If you look to the time when Manasseh, well, the houses of Israel, the, the tribes of Israel, went into the promised land and occupied that territory, you will find that Manasseh was divided into two because it got a portion of its territory on one side of the Jordan River and on the other side. So there was always two pieces to it. And sometimes in history it was kind of hard to keep those two pieces together. And guess what? It still is. It still is. In this country... You can always, always find, wait a bit, they're brothers, but they're kind of two pieces. We went to the one battle site. There was a bridge. We read everything there. The southerners were on this side of the bridge. The northerners were coming from the other side of the bridge. And they came up onto the bridge 
and these people opened fire in the middle of battle. And the sad thing was that one officer on this side, when he opened fire, he shot his brother-in-law, who was fighting on the other side. Brothers fighting each other, family members fighting each other. Why did we have that terrible phase in our history? There are other reasons as well. I can give another sermon on that. When you look at the spiritual side of things and what the church was doing at that time when it should have been a big thriving church, I mean the church of God, it wasn't because everybody was out making money. That's what had happened to the United States. That is what's still happening in the United States. People making money. What I want you to do is to make sure that when you travel or read or watch TV or listen to the news, Try to get your mind focused on the fact that, wait a bit, we have the scriptures and we should always view things to, through the scriptures. Joseph's name was added. That's what the name means. God will add. Is there any nation on the face of the earth that could have started so small that God added and kept on adding and kept on adding whether it was wealth, whether it was people, whether it was whatever they needed. It even amazes me that 200 years before the English came here, the Spanish came here and let loose a bunch of cows and horses so that when the English came here, they could just go catch them. Yes, thousands of them were loose. Your forefathers went out and cat caught them. Timber, farmland, rivers flowing deep and wide. A wonderful blessing. I've been in the Church of God for over 50 years. So many have taken the scriptures, the prophecies especially, to try to predict the downfall of the United States. They did it in the 60s, they did it in the 70s, they did it in the 80s, they did it in the 90s, and every reason they gave why the United States would fall tomorrow was not right, didn't work out. We were going to run out of oil back in the 70s. Now we're exporting oil. Because this country is the country of Joseph and God is still adding to it. Now some people don't like the way it's being added to. We don't want these immigrants forgetting that we were all immigrants. Amazing. God said Israel would be, would be like a tree that all the fowls of the world, all the, the birds of the world would come and rest in this tree. Mm -hmm. It's still happening. That's why people like coming here. It doesn't mean we don't have problems. It doesn't mean that when all things work out, this thing will come down crashing around our ears because we're not really a righteous people. Let's go to the book of Hosea. In conclusion, the book of Hosea. And I can give several sermons just on the book of Hosea. I'm sure Mr. Dart has some tapes or CDs on the book of Hosea. Let me just preface it by saying, Hosea is like Hosanna. It means salvation. This is a book of the salvation 
of Israel. But in Hosea 4 and verse 6, Hosea laments, he said, My people, this is God speaking here, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I will also reject you that you will not be a priest for me, seeing that you have forgotten the law of God. I will also forget your children. Lack of knowledge. We have more knowledge today than any people that have ever lived. The children in this room, within a few years, will baffle us with the knowledge they're going to accumulate over the next few years. My son talks technical language that I don't understand. It he, he, he could just as well be speaking Chinese. A lot of American people have a lot of knowledge. But ask them, where do you come from? How did you get here? How did your nation get here? How did this nation survive through all the problems we've had, through all the good and bad leaders we've had? Only by a miracle. You see, when I travel, and I've traveled a great deal, and I travel through Tennessee and Virginia and Maryland and Pennsylvania and I go to Washington DC and I see a capital city that is almost unequaled in the world in beauty and splendor and museums that you can go to free of charge and you could spend a month there we spent a week we didn't even begin to scratch the surface. I saw things in those museums that I never ever thought I would see. Right now is the anniversary of the dropping of the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Three weeks ago, our family stood and looked at the Enola Gay the B-29 bomber that dropped that bomb. I stood with my grandchildren and I said, that is it, Enola Gay, that plane that dropped the atomic bomb. A lot of history has happened in these last couple of hundred years. Let us read the scriptures. Let, it, let the scriptures teach you so that any time you view, whatever you view in life, try to view it from the scriptures because there's two ways of viewing things. You can view things the way the world views it or you can view it the way God wants you to view it. So don't be destroyed for lack of knowledge. Educate yourself. Get excited, get interested with the good things that God has given us.